Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming to the, uh, the, the data mining track. And uh, we're going to get started now. And uh, the first speaker of uh, this session is uh, Ilya Karmanov, who will be telling us about um, teaching yourself deep learning with R. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so this kind of started off with something to address this meme um, floating around. And it kind of goes in the way of, I'm sure many of you have got some friends that don't do neural networks, but are pretty good statisticians. You know, they may have mass physics and statistics PhDs, but they haven't really heard about neural networks or, or, or deep learning. Um, and you kind of want to explain to them what your field is about. Um, and if you kind of do a Google search about that, most of the stuff you get is kind of like this as an intro. Um, What's wrong with that? Well, it's not just that this is in, in Python. Um, it's also that I think it's kind of a, a crappy way to really get someone with good statistical background into neural networks. Um, it also kind of goes along with what um, Karpathy was saying when he created the uh, neural network course at, at Stanford. Right? He goes, it's easy to fall into the trap of um, abstracting away the learning process. Um, magically make them work on your data. Uh, when he did that course, he mentioned that they specifically asked uh, all the students to do all the forward and backward propagation uh, code themselves in, uh, in raw NumPy. Uh, and henceforth, my motivation for this is uh, kind of twofold. Uh, one, what got me into it was uh, this leaky abstraction argument from Karpathy that um, it, it's nice to really put this together from building blocks so that you appreciate um, what is abstracted away from frameworks. If you take um, a framework like TensorFlow, uh, you can see that a lot of the code um, is heavily optimized, so it's kind of difficult for you to figure out what it's doing. Uh, or it abstracts, it calls the um, QDNN API, um, and that's in kind of really low-level C as well. So it's quite hard to get an understanding uh, why that works and which bits of the code are computationally um, uh, intensive and take a long time to run, whereas which are not, which are quite easy. And then the second argument, um, sorry, the second reason really was uh, just for my friends that, are, that don't do neural nets, um, and I think that they have you know, way more uh, stats knowledge than necessary to really get at it. And I think if you take it apart into these small blocks and you piece them together one by one, like I'll do in these talks, um, that you need very little extra information to really get started into this field. And I think it's a much better way of doing it than just um, you know, jumping in with some tutorial about how to do some kind of forecasting. Right. Um, so the, the very basic step that I wanted to do was a, um, a simple linear regression. Um, and uh, assuming that our, that our matrix is positive definite, non-singular, we can do quite um, an easy closed form solution. Uh, to solve for a beta hat parameter um, like this. Uh, so hopefully that's kind of quite, quite trivial to, to most of you guys, right? Um, so another way of um, solving a set of ordinary least squares is to use a iterative method uh, called gradient descent. And that's the first building block for our neural networks because that's what we'll be using. Um, and it's quite easy uh, to do this for linear regressions because we have a convex loss, so our local minima are global minima. We don't have to carry, uh, worry too much about you know, any kind of second derivative or anything like that. Uh, we just have this algorithm, which is basically we initialize our parameters with um, a random value. Uh, we do our first prediction, which is a guess. Uh, then we calculate the difference between the truth and our prediction. And then this goes into our cost function. Uh, which uses that somehow. Here we have the, uh, the mean squared error. Um, we take the derivative of our loss with respect to our parameters. We have this value. And then we update our parameters um, with this value uh, to uh, a small degree. And the, um, the step size that we use to update our parameters is um, normally called the, uh, the learning rate. All right, so we move in the opposite direction of, of the gradient. And gradually, we kind of fall along this nice convex loss function. So that's a way of um, coding up a um, linear regression uh, using, stochastic, using gradient descent, in this case, uh, instead of a closed form solution. Um, so now it kind of brings us to a few more interesting steps. Uh, so now imagine we have a logistic regression, right? So we want to predict the probability of something. 
Um, so here we obviously have an activation function, which previously was, was one, it was a linear function. Uh, the logistic sigmoid, so we squash our output between, between zero and one. Um, and instead of minimizing the quadratic loss, uh, we minimize the negative log likelihood, right, of the Bernoulli distribution. Uh, so this is kind of quickly how I coded it up to get my sigmoid function and my log likelihood function in R. Um, so now we have a nonlinear activation function, um, so the, the mean squared error loss will no longer be convex, which will make optimization hard. Uh, so we have this different loss function. Um, I called it the negative log likelihood, which is maybe what you're more familiar with. Um, with neural networks, you would normally call this the uh, cross-entropy loss. Um, and you can see that this is a more specific case of a general cross-entropy loss um, that you get um, for, for, uh, for neural networks and usually for a softmax multinomial just at regression. Um, you can see that the code for me to implement implement the logistic regression was pretty much the same as the linear one, except I just, instead of multiplying it kind of implicitly by one, I, I have my sigmoid function. Um, and the, the gradient descent is just like it was before. Uh, so moving um, forward, now imagine that we have more than two classes uh, to predict. We want to use a multinomial logistic regression or a, um, a softmax function. And here we do two small differences. We use the softmax function to squash the sum of our values to one um, so that we can interpret um, each output. And we'll have the number of outputs equal to the number of classes we have as the probability of that, um, as a conditional probability given the data of that class. Uh, and, and now we use a more general version of the uh, cross entropy loss function, which um, is pretty much the same as this one except that um, we enforce that the sum um, of our activation functions equal, is equal to y, and then j, which is the number of classes, is equal to two. If you plug that in, you'll get the same equation um, as previously. Uh, so before I kind of jump into the, the neural network part, I just wanted to kind of go through these and try and find a, a, a common theme. So with the linear regression, you can see that we only have one output and we don't have any activation function on this. We're minimizing the mean uh, squared error. For the single class logistic regression, what we do is that we um, apply sigma activation to this. And then with the uh, softmax regression, we now have as many outputs um, as we do classes. We squash all of that with our softmax function and we have this more general cross entropy loss, which doesn't assume um, that we only have two classes. And so number four will be a, um, an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, the most kind of basic neural network that you can create. Um, and what I just wanted to show was that that kind of does look like you have a bunch of softmax regressions stacked on top of one another. Um, so I think that's kind of quite a nice theme uh, to think about it with. Um, so you have a series of legit regressions stuck on top of each other. Um, which kind of means that we can say that uh, a logic is a neural network with a sigma activation and, and no hidden layer, right? Because here we have here we have this one. I've lost my mouse, but here we have these and anything in between. All the blue stuff will be a, a hidden layer, uh, and it's kind of I think intuitive to think of a neural network as a combination of two things. Uh, so you have many of these kind of logistic regressions. Um, in this example, normally there'll be ReLU, but stacked on top of each other, and you can have many of these. And then if you add a bit more implicit structure, like you start doing convolutions, um, you, which would be quite useful for images, or you have some other kind of structure used for a different data set, these are your feature generators, right? And, and these are what make your deep learning deep. Um, because the, the final part is your readout layer. You have a typical softmax. That just correlates the features that you've generated with your um, labeled data set. Um, and that will look like the exact softmax that you've seen. What has really kind of made this stand out is that we've had uh, enough data, uh, enough processing power to be able to create so many parameters uh, and, and structure them in such a way that we have these automatic you know, feature generators, these huge number crunches um, that take many, many iterations uh, to learn what to extract from the data to better correlate it with uh, the labels. 
and actually what um, we do um, quite a lot, um, well, I guess at, at Microsoft with our partners, um, is kind of, actually Facebook um, have done that by um, training on, on the Instagram hashtag data set, right, and then doing that on, on ImageNet. It's something called transfer learning. So transfer learning is that you take a, a deep neural net that's been trained on a data set, maybe like an Instagram, uh, and then you chop off the head, which is the softmax layer. Um, you replace it with something with, with the number of parameters is equal to your specific data set. And normally you can freeze or unfreeze the, the main feature generator, and then you train just the head. Right, so the, the features it's extracting are the same as the ones it has been taught to do before, um, but all you're really doing is you're fine tuning this kind of correlation of feature uh, to label. Um, so that's how I like to think about deep neural networks, and if someone were to ask me, you know, what makes them deep is that um, the structure of the network is such that it allows them to automatically generate these features which previously would, we would have had to handcraft. Uh, if any of you have done image recognition before, you may have used scale and varying feature transformation to do that. Uh, now, CNNs like ResNet and DenseNet um, have done that automatically for you. Um, so uh, the way I kind of created uh, this, and um, by the way, if you check the, the blog post on the front slide, you can follow that through in a bit more detail, and that links to a GitHub, uh, which contains the whole library so if you wanted to, you could run through these examples yourself. Um, I would encourage you to just try and create it yourself using better R code than I would have done. Um, but uh, so the way I kind of pictured the MLP was in, uh, in four steps. Uh, so just like before we initialize our weights, uh, previously I set all of them equal to one. Uh, now we have so many parameters that we have to be a bit careful, maybe use a Gaussian distribution. There's a lot of um, work and research on the, on the um, on the density function used to initialize these weights, um, but uh, for this particular example, Gaussian works fine. Um, and then, so the second main step is that we use stochastic gradient descent as our optimization method. Now, this is exactly the same as the gradient descent method I showed you with the logistic regression. The only difference is that uh, now we sample a subset of our data set, um, usually with, um, with replacing and then we calculate the gradient for that small uh, sample, which we call a batch, and then we update the weights, uh, and then we keep doing this. Uh, so you can kind of see here, the structure is that we have a certain number of epochs, we sample a whole training data set uh, to uh, shuffle it, we get all of our mini batches, and then for every single mini batch, uh, we update the, the bias and the weights, which are the parameters um, of our neural network. Uh, so the third step uh, is um, part of the stochastic gradient descent. You have to update the weights, and then the way that uh, the weights have been updated here is that we use um, backpropagation to get the change, to get the delta for those parameters. Um, and then you can see here that these are our global parameters. They're gradually updated as we go through our data set. Uh, it's a bit difficult to go through the, uh, the, the back propagation algorithm, but uh, I would definitely encourage you to do that by checking out the, the, the blog and going through the code. Uh, it's a bit long, but the principle remains exactly the same as with softmax, right? Um, so in, in this example, we would, I use cross-entropy loss function, uh, which basically gives us uh, the following gradient here. Um, you may be inclined to use different loss functions depending on what kind of output you need. Um, namely, if it's, uh, obviously if it's a regression, you can go back to mean squared error. And the, the activation functions um, I used here, sigmoid and sigmoid prime. Um, so I kind of wanted to jump forward from here to, because an MLP is not particularly useful. I haven't really seen uh, a, a useful one in, in, in practice. Um, Usually we go with like boosted trees or, or, or something else. It's a thing, it's a good way of getting introduced to deep learning, but stacking um, lots of fully connected layers on top of each other, um, I really haven't seen a use for that. Um, but what is actually useful and we use all the time, especially for computer vision or any kind of, um, kind of signal processing nowadays is um, a convolutional neural net. And I just wanted to give you an example of, of that here. 
So imagine we have this um, charming hippopotamus uh, in, uh, in grayscale, uh, and we have this uh, three by three matrix that looks like this along the diagonal. Um, and we can take a small spot, three by three, from the image. We can um, do a matrix multiplication with the um, feature map over here, and then we can take the result and we can sum it, and we'll get a scalar, right? And then what we would do is that we would replace this part of the image, which is an intensity from zero to 256, with the scalar that we've just created. Um, and that is basically what a convolution is, and it's not particularly meaningful at the moment, but what we can do is that we can repeat this operation by sliding it across um, the image, column and row. And then once we do that, and we collect our results, we get this resultant image on the right. Um, and that particular filter um, is um, an emboss. Uh, you can replace this matrix with other stuff to uh, sharpen or blur your image. And you can kind of think of it as a really basic Photoshop filter, um, something that happens uh, when you apply to your images. And um, the only difference is if you actually run this algorithm, you can see that it's incredibly um, computationally intensive. And normally, this is definitely abstracted away to the GPU. And what um, the library QDNN, um, what that does is that before, if you have lots of fixed size images, it actually runs a heuristic. Uh, called Autotune, and it figures out from a bunch of maybe 10, 15 different algorithms to do convolutions which one is optimal for your image size, right? So this is a very intensive algorithm, and you have a few different choices of, of how you can do that. Um, and if you randomly initialize your matrix, and you run all these uh, different possible versions of hippos, this took me a while to do in the CPU, um, you get a result like this, right? And this is a feature map. So this is our randomly initialized feature map. If I go back to the softmax regression, this is equivalent to randomly initializing with a Gaussian, um, and this is our first prediction. So th this is a randomly generated feature uh, from the data set that we wish to, uh, in the final layer, correlate with our label, which would probably be, you know, HIPAA. Um, what is left to implement for this is a, um, a method of back propagating the error through this to fine tune the feature maps that the algorithm uh, will learn. So I just wanted to kind of put this in context uh, with, the, with the other models. You can see that with convolution, we uh, only look at a, a kernel size number of inputs uh, as opposed to a fully connected layer where we attach all of them. And we can have many, many hidden layers. Normally, it would go uh, convolution max pooling relu, convolution max pooling relu, uh, so these groups. And then finally, we have a readout layer um, which is the exact same one um, that, that you've seen before. Um, so I think that's pretty much it uh, here. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of code that I've thrown at you, um, which is why I recommend going to the, the, the blog and the GitHub um, and kind of writing it out for yourself. But I, I, I really hope that it kind of shows that in terms of the individual blocks, there's nothing specifically that's, um, that's new. It's just the way that it's put together is a bit different. Um, and hopefully, just by going through this on your own, you can get a really good jump start to creating your own library to do a convolution on your net in, in R. Right? And then once you can do that, you're pretty much up to speed uh, with most of the models that are released in academic papers maybe two, from two, two, three years ago. And I think that's a great way to um, jump start into it as opposed to having these leaky abstractions and not knowing what is important, what isn't important. Um, as an example to conclude, um, when I was writing this, I realized what's really important is um, the scaling of your inputs. Uh, if you forget to do that, if you do that incorrectly, you'll explode, you, you know, you'll fail to converge, gradient descent won't work uh, super well for you. That's something that most packages would handle automatically and it may cause you to um, ignore it and then you don't realize what's working and, and why not. Uh, so thank you very much and welcome any questions.